Hello, uh, I'm Michael Dean. I'm co-founder and director of Avonmore Capital. Avonmore Capital is a bridging and development finance business based in London, lending to SME property developers in England and Wales. I'm also co-founder and director of Chartfield Homes, which is a strategic land company looking to develop high-end houses in the southeast of England between five and 100, 100 units. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Series, and I will now hand you over to our host, Jonathan Bowman-Perks. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. And Michael, you and I met on um, Clubhouse in the, as we were laughing earlier in that third stage of lockdown, when we do anything to connect with people. But really, we both found that Clubhouse wasn't quite the way we want to communicate. So this is a nice way of getting your message across. And there was a lovely guy, Scott, who was a, a great connector. And you also talked about your coach, Lloyd, uh, who's been very good looking after you. So well done, Lloyd, in, uh, in uh, being your coach. Tell us about a little bit more about Current Role, those two different businesses that you're running. And then let's go back to early life, Michael. So firstly, a bit on the, the Current Role. So uh, Avonmore Capital is a, is a bridging and development finance business based in the city of London. Um, we started it as uh, with just three of us co-founders. And we've grown it to nearly 30 people. Um, we're, we're lending something in the region of uh, 200 million pounds a year, hoping to do about 300 million pounds next year. Um, and we lent, uh, we lent uh, as much last month as we lent in our in our first or, and second year combined. So um, we've come we've come a very long way. Uh, Chartfield is uh, is more nascent. Uh, we founded that with uh, a, a, a very experienced guy called Richard Potts. And he's leveraging off our financing and, and financing skills. And we're using his experience in the house building sector to help him grow and develop that business. In, in addition to those two roles, I'm also an investor in, in a number of other businesses and also an advisor to a few other businesses, including some family businesses that, that I'm also involved in. Fantastic. Well, so I'm dying to know the man you are today with this entrepreneurial flair that you have and uh, many different uh, fingers in many different pies. How did it all begin? What, what influenced and shaped the, the man you are today, Michael? Take us back to early childhood and people who shaped you on the way and the leader you are now. So I, I didn't start from the, 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 the loftiest of beginnings, Jonathan. So I was born to a single mother who had come to the UK from Eastern Europe in the late 70s. Uh, she and my father didn't quite work out and um, she had some very tough times in the first couple of years while I was growing up. She was very fortunate to meet my stepfather, uh, my late stepfather, who was a very big influence on my life. And um, he, he helped her have the, help her and me have the financial stability uh, to to move on with our lives. And my mother was a it, my mother is a very uh, educated person, very capable person, and a big influence in my life. Very very entrepreneurial, and she gets that from from her father as well. Um, we we moved from uh, we moved from West London where we were living uh, to to the home counties. And um, fortunately, because of the stability that my stepfather gave us, it enabled us to uh, enabled me to be able to go to private schools. Um, and so uh, having, having brought up and, and born into, you know, relative, uh, you know, relative difficult circumstances, uh, after a few years, uh, we, we were able to make a, a bit of a jump up in, in lifestyle. That being said, uh, being able to go to private schools came at a big sacrifice uh, for my parents. And my parents did have to sacrifice a lot and could have lived probably a much more lavish lifestyle had they not had they not done so so I was definitely a beneficiary of of that um but being at private school I, I definitely had a bit of a chip on my shoulder um I you know my I, I turned up at school with well I was dropped off by my mum in you know a relatively modest car when all my all my colleagues or my, my school pals were being dropped off in you know, flash BMWs and, and Mercedes and, and, and whatnot. And, and, and I was being dropped off in a, in a, in a, in an old banger. Um, and so I, I think I sort of felt that and, and that slightly carried its way through to, to senior school. And I always had a bit of a, chi a chip on my shoulder, always had a bit of a point to prove. Um, and I think that drove me and, and, and to some extent still drives me today. So 
academically i i did okay uh i i was able to get a get a place at, at bristol university to do chemistry to read chemistry and and i was lucky enough to meet my wife there um i, I wasn't ever really going to be a chemist i think it was just a a, a three-year course that i felt that i could do and i would be able to get through university uh relatively unscathed and and so it proved uh, and following which I, and then went to reading university and did a, a master's in real estate which is a which is a well-trodden path for, for people wanting to get into commercial commercial property um once i'd left reading i was offered a place at a top four or top three uh, commercial real estate consultancy called cushman and wakefield and I think it was very early at Cushman and Wakefield that I realized that it, it I was probably not cut out for, for full-time employment. I think that um, I, I just naturally had a bit too much entrepreneurial flair and drive and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I, and I also wanted to uh, want, wanted, uh, wanted to have some, uh, some leadership responsibility, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't always, uh, I, I couldn't always, uh, I couldn't always take that. Yeah, I, I'm really fascinated by all this, uh, and I'd love to hear the, more of the story in a minute. But uh, it, it really resonates with me, you know, mum bringing you up. Um, my father was killed when I was three, so my mother brought myself, my two brothers up on her own, but sadly didn't ever remarry. Uh, would have made life a lot more uh, pleasant. But, but I think your mother has a huge influence on you. The fact that she was entrepreneurial. Your father was entrepreneur. Your grandfather was entrepreneur. Her father. Uh, I can see it coming out in you, uh, and also the, the the chip on the shoulder. I I, I re relate to that. I was called Stone Age Perks when I was at school because they thought all my clothes came from the Stone Age <laughs> because they'd come from my brother Graham, the eldest, and David to me. And in fact, probably Graham had got them from the second hand shop. So so there was they could be quite cruel at, at uh, school at, at private school and um they became very conscious quite early on of, of the pecking order of wealth and um yeah it is interesting that, that that's driven you um to be clearly very successful uh, and i think it's something we always have to watch i remember i was long uh, for many years trying to prove my teacher who said i was thick and i was going to become a dustman that i wasn't stupid and, to go on and become a visiting professor at Cass Business School and do my master's degree and to prove to someone who's long dead and didn't have a clue or even was not interested in me that I was good enough, unlike that she thought I was, or to prove, you know, I don't know if you ever had that, that um, strange dream of going back to a school or a place and turning up in your Porsche or whatever it is, just to go, here, sod you, I've, I've succeeded. But then why are you doing that? Who, who are you doing it for? Are you doing it for them? Or are you doing it for you? I don't know. Does any of that have any, uh, any re resemblance or any resonance? It, 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 has, it has some resonance. I think there's always that, there's always that temptation to, to, to when, you, when you succeed and you have, that, you have that moment of achievement to turn around and, and, and shove it in the faces of the people that, that, that proved you wrong or or gave you a hard time along the way but but as you as you rightly point out it, there, there's nothing to be gained from that and actually the fact that you've achieved the things that you end up achieving you achieve that you've probably achieved that because your state of mind is is not been focused on negative things from the past but actually you're forward looking and you're thinking about you're thinking of your, your focus once my focus or your focus would be on things that are positive and that will generate energy and value not not things that are, are, are you know that, that create division and 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 are um writing old wrongs yeah that's very good and and it was interesting that you worked out at cushman and wakefield that it wasn't for you i i had the same thing 20 years in the military price waterhouse coopers ibm penna and then i really realized that actually i want to go on my own and one of my clients said why are you working for this firm we're not hiring that firm we're hiring you and I think you probably realized that doing things yourself was much more your scene. So pick up the pace again, if you would there, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that the, I think that Cushman and Wakefield is a, is a very, is a very good firm. I, I still have a very warm feelings for, for the place. And I have a lot of, a lot of connections and contacts 
that uh, 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 that I that I discovered there, both work, uh, who worked with me and also people I met while I was there. I think ultimately, when you're 22, 23, in an in an organisation like that, um, I probably lacked the emotional maturity to realise that uh, uh, realise what they wanted and expected from me. And when what they wanted me to do was to prepare schedules, to do filing, to do photocopying, to do, you know, that sort of bag carrying tasks that 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 junior members of staff tend to do in these types of organisations. I wanted to be doing deals and, you know, running around, you know, rain making and making things happen. And there was probably a lack of realism on my part, on the one hand, because I didn't really know anything on the other hand. Um, you know the environment was pro- the environment was was probably not uh, not not right for me either. So um, so yeah, I, 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 there, it, the writing was was very much on the wall, and, um, uh, and 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 certainly as as time went by, you could I could see that it was going to be a challenge for me to to have a long career there. Yeah, it, it, you, you've really triggered something in me that that um, my children are um, uh, what are they now. Um, 29 to 26 and many of their peer group um, are not prepared to stay in let's say Deloitte to wait and become a partner in years to come by serving at the bottom of the pile and doing the drudgery they're going but I want it now and 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 it is something that society has to adapt to and businesses have to adapt to that just because we went through that and we served our apprenticeship and we had to learn the way and and do some quite menial stuff doesn't mean that others are that excited to do that. And well, um, I think that you've brought up a good point there. Well, I, I think on that, on that, Jonathan, the when I look at the businesses that I've been involved in and I've built up over the last 10 years, I, I've done that as you would expect. We've, we've bootstrapped the businesses. We've not ta- we've not raised money externally. And so we've we've needed to do things that on 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 tight budgets. And one of the ways that I've done that is by taking uh, younger younger people, people fresh out of university, and training them up. And what I think made it made them attracted to working with me, uh, and and also being willing to work for possibly less money that they would than they would get in a corporate, is that I wasn't asking them to do the menial tasks that they would have been asked to do in in a, in a corporate environment and i would have given them i've been able to give them exposure to transactions and opportunities for personal growth and development of their career that they wouldn't have had uh, anywhere else and so that's been that has been a, fu- a big function mm. of uh, of the success that we've had in, in terms of building the teams yeah well done. Uh, the teams that we've got up as well very good very good i like it i like it yeah yeah. Okay. Right. So take us on to the next stage of uh, growth and develop to to here you are today as a as a leader and an entrepreneur. Yeah. So so I guess that within within Cushman's, I I was progressing kind of you know going up going up the ladder, albeit slowly, probably slower than some of my peers because uh, because I I was probably not playing the the office politics game as well as as well as others, and. Um, that that probably started to come to that, that ordinarily wouldn't have been that much of an issue, but come the beginning of two thousand and eight, we'd we'd already seen the start of the credit crunch, commercial property appetite from investors, and probably more importantly, banks was uh, uh, severely impaired, and I could see pretty early on that the writing was on the wall as far as the business that I was in, and probably lots of other businesses were concerned that that. A lot of these companies were going to need to start making redundancies. My, uh, I like to think that I've inherited something of a, a good survival instinct from my mother's father, who is the only person in his family to, to his immediate family to survive the Holocaust. And as a consequence of that, um, that survival instinct kicked in, and I thought, right, well, I need to, I need to find some other opportunities. Now, there were some opportunities to to be semi entrepreneurial and work for myself at the time, but I felt that. It was probably a little bit premature for me to do so. So I spoke to some recruiters and tried to get, uh, tried to get a job. And um, six, six months, uh, six, six months after, uh, six months after sort of starting my search, I finally got a, got a job offer uh, at, a, at a small PE house in their real estate funds uh, about uh, two or three weeks after Lehman Brothers went pop. So uh, wow, 
wow. so I did so I did uh, so I did did have a stroke of luck but I think I made my own luck there too yeah well look, I, I can't step over that phenomenal throwaway line that your grandfather survived the holocaust when so many around them died and I've read uh, a harrowing book called the bloodlands all about that area in eastern Europe between Germany and Russia when some 10 million were killed that wasn't even the war that wasn't the war that was just pogroms and uh, massacres of various people by local um, local people against the Jewish community so just give us a little flavor of, of what grandfather had to get through where he was which 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 part of Eastern Europe did he live in and um, and, and which camp was he in how did he survive just just give us a few minutes of that please well the I, I, I think, Jonathan, the, the, the difficulty is, is that I, I will probably not do justice to the story. I mean, all of these stories are amazing. My, my, grandfather, if my, my grandfather actually survived by, by the most almost dumbest of luck, um, where, where, they, where they lived was very much on the, on the eastern side of Poland, and it was when when basically when germany and russia decided to carve up poland mm -hmm. where they lived was right on the border and they they were actually just on the russian side but my so my my grandfather his brother and and my great grandfather tried to get on a train to go to 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 get on get on a train to germany uh, just before the hostility started to break out between germany and russia but for one reason or another, uh, my my great grandfather and my uh, great granduncle managed to get on the train, but my my grandfather didn't manage to get on the train. So my grandfather was stuck on what what, what turned out to be the Russian side, whereas my uh, my my great grandfather and my uh, my my granduncle ended up on the German side and most likely would have perished in in one of the camps. My grandfather. Um, being quite a resourceful chap, uh, seen, uh, managed to find his way into the Red Army, and um, wow. and, and and managed to help uh, and managed to do some interesting things within the Red Army, albeit not not as a soldier. Um, but because he was a Jew, uh, it meant that uh, the, the Russians didn't entirely trust him, and I think he ha he did have the occasional spell in and out of uh, of, of of gulags. Um, I'm probably butchering the history uh, a little bit, Jonathan. So you, you'll have to speak to my my cousin Jan, who is the the family historian. But uh, but needless to say, he was very uh, he, he was he, he was he was very lucky. Um, the women uh, the women in the family um, stayed in the village in in eastern Poland, which at the time was on the Russian side. But then when the Germans invaded uh, in, invaded Russia, that then became that then became Germany. Or became German controlled, and unfortunately, they they uh, the records show that they were they perished in in some woods. So, uh, you know, my, my grandfather sort of uh, by hook or by crook managed to 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 keep himself alive uh, during the wartime period, and then um, and and then after the war, met my my grandmother who who wasn't Jewish, um, which uh, which which added a, a whole new layer of complexity to the to to the. Uh, to the family complexion, and um, and 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 then they got married and settled down and and had a couple of children. Um, what, but what it, a story! It, it, interestingly, though, that in 1956, there was up to 1956, there was still quite a lot of Jewish people in Poland. Um, but my and my grandfather actually arranged uh, raised a lot of money for a lot of his his friends and colleagues to, to have enough dollars to be able to leave Poland and go to Israel, because that's what, what, what that was tends to be the done thing or to go to America. And he had the option of going, uh, but he decided to stay in Poland uh, because of uh, uh, close family ties with my, uh, my, my grandmother's family. So, so the not, so the non-Jewish family, they embraced him and, and want, and he was felt so close to them and, and a sense of loyalty to them that he decided to stay in Poland. What and a guy. Not, what a guy! Yeah, yeah. He 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 is he is an incredible guy. I don't think I will be able to do any justice to to him. No, you um, have you have uh, you have already. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, he, yeah, in, incredible guy, huge inspiration for me, and um, yeah. And, and whenever you or I or anybody else listening has a bad day, 
<laughs> let me let me tell you about a bad day. A bad day is when you're in a gulag or when all your family is getting exterminated or Russia and Germany are carving up your country and massacring everybody. Yeah. So it puts everything into context. No, thank you. Um, let's go. Let's go on to proudest and darkest moments in your work and life, and and maybe some themes that you've learned from that, uh, if you would, Michael. Um, that's that's great, Jonathan. I, I I think, as I said offline, I might answer this slightly differently, but I, I hopefully I can give uh, give everyone a, a good flavour. Um, the I, I've recently had some some great moments of pride uh, within within the business and within life. Uh, I have a you know beautiful wife, three beautiful children, a uh, lovely home. You know things things to be very thankful for and, and grateful for. And uh, I've I've recently uh, or I, myself and Zahir, my, my co-founder, recently been uh, awarded ac uh, industry accolades, uh, industry awards and fated, um, reaching milestones. These are all moments of great pride and, and things to take great satisfaction from. But I do think that the greatest lessons that life uh, of life are, are, are taken from moments of failure and, and the darkest moments. And I think that th there, there's definitely been some, you know, been some very dark and embarrassing and painful uh, experiences that uh, I and my family have had over the you know over the course of my life and and some of them are very difficult to talk about I, I've had moments of, of great despondency and and, and 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 senses of devastation to the extent that I might be I might be on a building tour and I've looked over the guardrail on the top floor of a 10-story building and contemplated, falling deliberately to the street below because I because I, I felt such a sense of despair or 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 I've had such dark moments where I'd be out on on, on my bicycle and I'd ride almost recklessly um, because I'd almost sensed have no sense of value in my life um, mm. that, that my life had had uh, that my life was worthless and had no meaning but ultimately um, the I, I had to I, I, I find find my north star um, that that survival instinct that I get from my my grandfather kicks in, and and I say no enough. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm, I'm going to plow on, and I'm going to work through this, and I'm going to get through this, and and it will get better. Yeah, I, I have deep admiration for you sharing that, and so many people are listening who'll be going. Me too. I, I have those moments, and as I listen to that. Um, that thought of that that building, I remember when in some of the most difficult times of my my divorce, uh, when money was tight and things were bad, I, I, I contemplated, looked out the window and thought, you know, do I go down head first or feet first? Perhaps head first because I'll die that quicker. Um, and I certainly, when I was in acute pain in hospital recently, I just there were moments when I just thought, I just want to die. This is just this pain is so acute. Now those moments do pass, but I, I think everybody if they're really true with themselves, probably have moments like that. And it's very encouraging to others to know that you have something to look forward to, as I do too. Um, I, I am a great believer in Stoic philosophy. And um, as Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, said, this is what I trained for. And so when I was in that hospital bed in such pain, I thought, this is what I trained for. Go, get you, you will get through it. And I think you having, Michael, you having your grandfather, a Holocaust survivor who'd lost everybody else, but he had an instinct to get through it. That's your North Star. That gives you encouragement and it gives me encouragement to hear that. So thank you for sharing that. Let's um, go on and have a look about you as a young man when you're about 16. What bit of advice now, as you're almost 40, um, what bit of advice do you wish you'd had knowing what you know now about what matters and what doesn't matter? Um, thanks, Jonathan. I, 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 I think this without question is just don't be in such a rush. Don't cut corners. The majority of, of business is done through relationships and relationships are built up through performance over time. And you can't perform over time by cutting corners. You, you've got to put in the work, you, you've got to put in the hours. And if I'd known at 16 that, I would have known to, to enjoy the work, 
enjoy the journey a little bit more at that early stage. I would have been able to enjoy my my 20s more because I would have been in less of a rush to get somewhere that I would have ended up anyway in the same place. Mm. That that ultimately you, you, you do the work, you, you don't let people down, you perform for people, you do things properly, people will trust you, people will like you, people will recommend you to other people and therefore the, the snowball effect will kick in over time. But if you try and but if you try and cut corners and you try and if if you if you try and cut corners and you try and do things before you're ready to do so, you'll end up you'll you'll end up damaging relationships permanently or or near permanently. People won't trust you and the opportunities just won't just won't come to you. Yeah, uh, I I so agree with that. And Stephen Covey talks about the law of the harvest that you can't plant the seeds just four weeks before the harvest is due and hope they'll suddenly sprout up. You've actually got to plant them right at the beginning and water them and tend them and, and cultivate them. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It is the result of a lot of hard work. And, and I so relate to that. I was in such a hurry too, and so keen to drive on and so intense. And, and actually, I think I missed a bit of fun on the way and just relaxing and actually, when you relax and you have fun with other people, you build relationships with them and they then help you. It isn't all just about you doing it on your own. Uh, great wisdom there. Great wisdom. Um, let's go through the Inspire Leadership Compass from moral quotient to legacy quotient. Um, MQ, what, what are the top three fundamental values that you've lived by, whether they were passed on to you from your grandfather as a Holocaust survivor or whether they were from your uh, entrepreneurial mother? who really um, hung in there and, and achieved great things. What would be your top three uh, fundamental values? Um, you know, I think ultimately it, it's being someone that being someone that others can trust. Um, I think that's a, a really important core value. Um, being reliable. Mm. I think that's uh, I think that's very important. I've I've learned that I've, I've learned that more recently. Being someone that people can rely on, mm. um, and um, you know, I think it's it's maybe a bit more than a one core value, but to say just to be a good man, mm. um, that you know. It, 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 it may it, you know it, it sounds it, it's it sounds very simplistic but actually there's there's a lot to that and if you come home at the end of the day and it, it, it come home at the end of the day and, and analyze and assess the things that you've done said was i was i a good man i i, I also recently got something from uh, jordan b peterson's 12 rules for life that something that uh, something that as i as i approach a certain age of uh, approach the age that I am in my life that this becomes relevant is that um, be the man that people turn to for comfort at your father's funeral and you know that that really struck me um, you know I, I am in I am in contact with my with my father and you know he is now approaching an age where that becomes increasingly a, a prospect Mm. and uh, uh, that you know that I will be at his funeral one day and actually being that person that people can turn to for for comfort and solace and that people can rely on mm. um in in that dark time being that rock I like to think that I've got very I, th I like to think I've got broad shoulders mm -hmm. you know when when people you know when 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 I'm in a friendship group and my friends friends are teasing each other I often get teased more than others, but I realize that they do that because I've got broad shoulders that are not, and that I can take it. Yeah. I can take it when others can't, others have got the thinner skin. And so again, when in, in that context is that, you know, that it's that that's being reliable. That's being a, that's being a mensch. If you want to use a, a mm -hmm. Yiddish expression, but someone that people can, mm -hmm. some of that people can lean on. I think that's, you know, that to me is, that to me is, is, is so much of what I'm about and what I want to be about. Lovely. I like that. No. And um, I, I always think of my old army sayings as one of my friends would say when he was getting criticized and people were ribbing him incessantly, he said, you mistake me for someone who gives a shit. 
<laughs> <laughs> and uh, I always always smile at that. Let's go on to PQ. Thank you for that. PQ, um, purpose, meaning, um, vocation, calling, dharma. If it's if you're from India, what? Why do you do what you do, Michael? Um, it, it's it's look it's it's a it's a it's a great question. Uh, meaning is uh, meaning is 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 a really important uh part of my life or it's becoming an in, in increasingly important part of my life um i'm starting to I'm, I'm starting to 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 focus on what's meaningful and not what's expedient um i i love building up businesses um because i love having a positive impact on people and a positive impact on the world the the businesses that i'm involved in at the moment I get immense satisfaction from giving people employment. That's number one. And not only giving them employment, but giving them knowledge and wisdom. That's knowledge and wisdom and skills that will be passed on to other people. Because if I if I take a young person in their early 20s, they will inevitably teach and coach other young people in their early 20s later on in their career. So, so there is a transfer of, of knowledge. But also, uh, there are there are people like Richard who who, who runs Chartfield, and, and there are other entrepreneurs that we're working with who, who we hope to work with soon, and we're helping them make their entrepreneurial dreams a reality by taking our experiences, some of our capital, and helping them grow and develop that, and that's meaningful to me, and to uh, 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 that that gives me meaning, but also. Uh, I'm involved in in the house building sector as a as a funder, but also uh, in someone who's unlocking the the the, the terrible red tape of planning uh, through Chartfield. Um, I've financed thousands of homes that wouldn't have otherwise been built. That's given employment to contractors and subcontractors who might have been otherwise unpaid with some of the specialist products that we have for for stalled and part completed development projects. And, and that for me is satisfying. It, it gives, you know, it feels meaningful to mm. have an, it, you know, to simplify it is I have an, a positive impact on people's lives professionally. Yeah. And, and, and that for me is important. Yeah, no, that, that, that all resonates. And then the third one round from purpose is health question, HQ. So what one tip would you give that's helped you with your physical health? And, and also a tip that's helped you with your mental health. So I've recently started working with a, with a, a, a personal trainer and the personal trainer has, has got me working on something called my fitness pal, which is an app, which helps you track the, the food, uh, the food and drink that you're consuming, but also steps, calorie uh, steps, exercise. Um, that's been really useful. Jonathan, I know you've been an advocate of, uh, intermittent fasting and I did actually do IF for about 18 months before I started working with the uh, before I started working with the, the personal trainer um, I did actually like intermittent fasting it worked really well for me that the issue was that when I started working with the personal trainer I uh, the personal trainer started telling me that I needed to eat more protein it was very difficult for me to fit the amount of protein I needed to fit in in two meals so I, I had to I've had to start eating breakfast again um, but otherwise, I, I, if for, for people that aren't into weight training or don't want to do, I, I think strength training is an incredibly powerful and valuable tool. Um, the, the, the strength training has actually been so uh, really effective for some of the uh, chronic knee issues that I've been having. Uh, I've had knee issues since I was 20. And um, because of that, I've actually uh, recently my my tennis doubles partner actually was remarking how much faster I was moving around the court and it wasn't because I was doing lots of running training it's because I was doing so much strength training yeah um, stay, stay with that because um I, I do think uh, having a personal trainer is a really good thing um our personal trainer is training my wife in the garage at the moment with our sort of gym kit in there uh, and when I'm better after uh, recovering from hospital and infection I, I will be back to training again and I do about three days a week hit training which I'm a great believer in strength-based training um the intermittent fasting, the lovely thing, uh, while I used to do 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of uh, eating, um, 
recovering from hospital and need to build my immune system back up, I'm doing 12-12, which means I actually have three meals, uh, substantial meals a day, because uh, I'm burning up so much calories fighting the infection. I'm probably getting through three and a half thousand calories just walking around. Um, so I've got a heart rate strap on at the moment recording uh, my heart rate. And because it's fighting the infection, it looks like I'm training in the gym all day long. So I'm getting great scores. Um, but um, don't, don't give up completely on what they call um, uh, time restricted eating or intermittent fasting. Uh, the, the book is The Circadian Code, which I've just finished reading by doc, Dr. Panda, a fascinating Indian doctor, in which all our organs have their own clock. Um, and our sleep is very important, but that intermittent fasting, clearly 16, eight is better because you get ketosis and you get autophagy, which breaks down cancerous cells and builds up new ones. But even 12, 12, it's not bad. Um, and you can have your three meals a day and cram in the protein. So you might be able to weave something into that. That's great. What about uh, mental health? We, we both talked about our own mental health challenges and many people will have had them. What, what, is, what has helped you with having good mental health? So I think that there's there's a number of different factors that go into that. I've I've been a, a a very regular meditator probably for the last five or six years, uh, possibly slightly longer, and um, the the act of meditation has has definitely has definitely been very helpful. Um, help very very help help me help help center me. Um, I, I I remember one uh, one Christmas day when I had to cook a, a large. Christmas meal for everyone and, and 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 people in my family were amazed at how calm and relaxed I was and I, and I have to say I possibly had one of the best meditation sessions I'd ever had in my life and it was only a 10-15 minute calm daily calm session but it just it just centered me in, in, and it just de- de-stressed me in such a nice way and um, the other things that, that are important exercise uh, being able to exercise is very is very useful um, then but also um, having a good social group around you and having the right people around you uh, who you can bounce ideas off or, or, or share and socialize the good and the bad. Um, I, I've, it's not uncommon for me to share with a large group of people. If I, if I've had a, if, if occasionally I would get some bad press or someone would send me a, a nasty email or, or someone would troll me on the internet or troll, troll my social accounts. And rather than rather than keeping it to myself and being embarrassed about it, I'll actually share that. I'll screenshot it and I'll I'll repost it on my social feeds, or I'll repost it within my uh, within my close uh, close friends on say on the WhatsApp group. And um, this uh, particularly the uh, one of the good things about the lockdowns and work and being closer to home is that I've actually developed a really nice uh, network of very supportive friends. Uh, in in my local area and so being able to speak to them on a daily basis uh, on whatsapp and then seeing each other every every week or every other week um, that sense of community has been really valuable in um, it it for, for my mental health um, you know it's it's made made me feel not not alone uh, in a way that probably pre-lockdown or two three years ago I didn't really I felt I felt like I didn't, you know, outside of my old friends from uni and, and stuff like that, I didn't have that many, many people that I was close to. And, and, and that, that change has been really meaningful. No, I, I'm um, really interested by what you say. And I'm particularly sad that you've been trolled. And uh, I, uh, my wife and I uh, run a charity for vulnerable girls and women uh, who go through modern day slavery, trafficking, abuse online, physical, emotional, sexual, um, and mental health issues. And, and it's a really big problem. And uh, we're, we're working with a fascinating company called Digital Identity Net. And their aim is to get uh, almost like two parts of a key that people can't communicate with you unless they've got a digital identity. So you know who they are. And I think that's the way ahead for places like Twitter and things that, that people cannot communicate unless you know who they are. And you can uh, choose to have no one able to communicate with you unless they declare their identity. Because I don't think these scumbags should be allowed to hide behind anonymity and have a pop at anybody. You've actually, if you've got a, an issue, come out and say the issue, but name yourself. Um, I just think it's the worst form of cowardice out there. And I have no truck with it. What's your thoughts, Michael? Uh, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm really supportive of, of that initiative. Uh, 
I actually decided to not use Twitter. Um, I've not been on Twitter for the last 15 months. I still haven't, I still have an account, but ultimately I'd rather, I, I find, I find the ecosystem of Twitter so divisive and so negative. Um, I think, I think the way that a lot of the algorithms work is designed to, to breed division and, and, and stoke, stoke up hate. Um, and, you know, I think that there's that there's a you know there may be some. I actually think that behind that there there are some potentially some malicious forces that are deliberately driving that. But that's probably a conversation for a different time. No, um, I, think, and, I think you're right. And, and, and I think consequently, I if we're talking about mental health and things that have been really positive for mental health, the the minute the day I stopped going on Twitter, looking at my feed, uh, in the way that I did before. I gained probably an hour and a half or two hours a, a day of my life, but the the mental impact of it was so of the, the the mental lift that you get is just so significant because if you you know that I I I got into a spat with some moron uh, on on Twitter back in the summer of last year about you know in the end you're like two bald men fighting over a comb it's, it's like what are you what is the argument here about and then you know that they, they sign you know and then they they, they sign it off and they, they they sign it off by saying well that's because you're a racist or you're this or you're that and you're like, what where do you get that from what, what that makes no sense to me at all and um people with people just throwing throwing mud at each other you know people calling each other pedos and this and that and the other like, baseless accusations that you would never say these things to people's faces yet somehow people think it's perfectly acceptable to you know to, to set fire to people on, on digitally it, it it's lo it's illogical it makes no sense to me whatsoever yeah. and to not have that and to not have that in my life is just yeah i it it it, 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 make, it makes your life so much better it, it does and i i concur with that so i uh, for my own mental health during uh, lockdown, because it, it hit my business quite hard and uh, I had commitments, but I had far less money, uh, probably a, a sort of 80% drop in income. And um, I found, listening to the Daily Stoic was part of my morning routine. I got rid of the news. I didn't listen to the news because the news is very depressing. I read the, the week once a week to get an update of what's going on in the world and internationally. It's a good magazine. Um, mindfulness, like you, for 20 minutes, uh, either yoga or HIIT training. And um, I just didn't spend time on social media. Uh, and it was so liberating and um, so life enhancing. Um, and I think people need to really carefully think about your mind is depends on what, what shit you put into it. Now, if you're putting, if you're feeding it with good nutritional stuff, it's going to do well. But if you feed it full of um, McDonald's junk food and pizzas, you're going to have a problem. And that's what people have been doing. Um, let's go quick fire uh, towards the end because there's so many things we could talk about. But let's go EQ, CQ, EQ, emotional intelligence. What would be a sort of top tip? You know, you talked about relationships and trust. What's the top tip you've learned about building emotional and social connections with people? So, I, I think one of the uh, one of the books that really was formative in this was the was a book called The Healing Connection, um, and it's been it's been really transformative for me as an individual because it's what what it has helped me do is is to focus on how to build connections with people um at, you know rather than disconnection and so always looking for with the person that's in front of you try to understand their their, their personal circumstances try to understand things from their point of view and and and, and never uh you know and and I'll actually put it to you in a different way, Jonathan, that we was within, within the real estate industry, one of the things that we were taught actually when I was at Cushman and Wakefield very early on, they said, whatever you do, never piss anyone off. Someone might annoy you over the phone, but never tell them to naff off or, or, or be rude to them. Take it, put the phone down, and then you can scream, turn the air blue, because you, you just don't know when you're going to need that, that person. You, you never know when you need that, that, that other person. Um, and so don't say anything, don't say anything negative or destructive it, but if you can say something constructive or positive, do that. And, and that, and that's probably my, my number one top tip for, uh, for building connections. 
Great. I uh, know. I, I really, I really do like that. You can't unsay things you've said. You, yeah. you can't put them back in again. They're out of the box. And so uh, I, I'm always working on one being non-judgmental about other two people, which is a, a hard task. It's very easy to be judgmental about yourself. I'd learn other people. And secondly, non-attachment to a position, to a point of view, to a bit of stuff that you have that, you know, you smash it and you're really upset. Well, it's, it's broken. It's just a glass. Um, CQ, cultural intelligence question. There you are with a, a family that comes from the, uh, the, the border of what was Poland as it was ripped apart between Germany and Russia um, and, and coming uh, to this country and, and perhaps people treating you differently or, or not as your mother was a single mother. Um, there's lots of opportunities, as we said, at public school, the differences and things like that. But what have you learned about diversity, equality and inclusion that, that you'd give as a top tip to help people succeed in life? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. The, it, when, I, when I grew up, despite growing up in, in the home counties in, in the early 80s, the, there was actually a, a surprisingly diverse uh, street that I lived on. And my best friends who, who lived across the street, they were Iranian. Their, their next door neighbours were uh, were Filipino, uh, albeit that they, the the girl who who lived next door to them used to used to call them uh, quite rude racist names, uh, which I'd had no idea what what it meant at the time. And then one day, you know, one day I used what the word that she used, and their uh, the the parents came over to to talk to my mum and 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 said, look, you can't use this word; it, it's really offensive. And my mum says, look, you know. We're, we're, we're not from this country. We weren't, you know, we're not from this country. They're not from this country. We are the same. There's, there's no difference to us. And fundamentally, we have, uh, fu fundamentally, when I was growing up, there are so many people from so many different, uh, different backgrounds. I mean, my mother worked in, in pharmacy. So, you know, which, which is incredibly culturally diverse uh, industry. Um, you know, you, you, it, it, it's certainly not, you know, hom homogenous, homogenous and, and white you know it, it takes all shades and and frankly that's that was a very very good thing it was a very positive thing for me to see um and so and and if you look at the the, the businesses that i'm i'm involved in i've been involved in um that it, it it pretty much takes all sorts you know there's people from all all backgrounds all ways of life um and um ultimately it's not about it's not about where you're from or what you look like. It's what is the positive contribution that you're able to make to 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 this business, to this situation, to this team, to the community, to the to the wider world as a whole. That's that's a lovely way. Your positive contribution. I like that very much. Thank you. Uh, quick fire RQ, BQ, and LQ. Resilience. One top tip about being resilient and bouncing back from adversity. Then brand, tip about your own personal brand, and then legacy. What would you like your legacy to be? In terms of resilience, I think it's a, just a question of just put one foot in front of the other and keep going and, and don't stop. Um, you might, things may feel difficult today, but ultimately there's always going to, there's always tomorrow. And as long as there's always tomorrow, you've always got an opportunity for, to make things better. Um, in terms of brand, um, I'd like to think that my brand is, you know, what my brand is, is, is about being open, honest and, and, uh, and, and, and helpful someone uh, and someone who wants to connect. Um, I can't speak for other people's brands, but I think ultimately it's, it's about being consistent. Just be, cons if you can be consistent with who you are and how you operate, um, that 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 will go a long way to you building and developing your own personal brand. Yeah. Because if you're inconsistent, people really won't know what you stand for. Yeah. But I think most people know what I stand for, what and they know what what they're going to get when they when they encounter me. Great. And legacy? What would you like your legacy to be after you die? Legacy. Uh, legacy for me it will be making sure that I. Leave, you know, I think I think everyone will, everyone of my generation will generally say this, but to want to leave the world in a better place than than when we found it, um, and to give 
our children and their children the skills and understanding to do so. Mm. Thank you. Um, down to the last couple of questions, um, executive teams and then your favorite book, and then we'll have the top tip. So executive teams, um, if there was one tip you'd give for turning around a toxic team or a team with a toxic individual in it to make it a high performing team, what would your bit of wisdom be, Michael? I, I think I can use a, a direct example in that we've had, uh, we've had a number of different team members within Avermore over the last six years, uh, probably something like 40 colleagues in total. Um, ultimately, the, the team when it's high performing and high functioning is when you have a, a very high talent quotient and the, the, the percentage of people who are high performing is as high as it can be. As soon as you have, as soon as you introduce only a couple of one or two or three uh, people who are not pulling their weight or they or they themselves have toxic personalities because they're either not happy with what they're doing or you know they have they have a a, a greater so, sense of self-importance um they're, they're not pulling they won't then be pulling in in the same direction as the rest of the company and unfortunately that that casts a great cloud over over the business and can start to uh, infect even the more even the most high performing of individuals and so ultimately what we've what we had done historically when that was the case we identified the people who were uh, who were effectively letting the side down and, and bringing uh, bringing the team into a into a more toxic territory and we would find ways to encourage them to go and seek other employment we do it in a we we would do it in a positive way or a friendly way uh, because we, we because we could see that these were not people who that these were not people who are suited to to our company first and foremost. But more importantly, this clearly wasn't what they wanted to do with this. This isn't what they wanted to be doing with their lives. And so, as a consequence of that, we we've effectively been doing them a, a service by saying to them, "Look, why don't you go and do something that you actually want to do?" rather than doing, you know, why don't, you, why don't you go do something that's meaningful rather than something that's expedient, which is carrying on, carrying on working here when you don't really like it. Yeah, beautifully put. Um, uh, one of the leaders I was with said, let me help you find your happiness elsewhere because it's not here. And I, I think um, we, we delude and deceive ourselves if we, we think that someone who's toxic will get better over time because um, rarely do they. They're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, and, and there's a lot of misfits. So uh, I, I think it's kind of for everybody, because if you're carrying one person, everybody's going, why are we carrying this person who's not pulling their weight, but we're all pulling away? It causes huge resentment. Okay, final couple. Um, normally I'd ask for one favourite book, but you've got a few covering all those topics. Um, will you uh, whiz through and explain why you've chosen them, which books you like? Well, yeah, you're gonna. I, I, I actually have to. I almost have to find my lists, Jonathan, because I, I because I did write quite a few, didn't I? Um, I I can start with uh, I, I can start with one on leadership, which is the the dichotomy of leadership by Jocko Willick and uh, Leif Babin, and I and I read that book in the first lockdown when you, you know the world was I guess kind of going to hell. Uh, you know the the people that we that we work with had i wouldn't say deserted us but they'd essentially said look you need to hit pause and um in some ways we were quite rudderless the one thing i knew was that the 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 what we were experiencing at the time wasn't going it it, it wasn't going to last um but i needed to just just uh, you know I, I had a you know we had a team of 20 people they needed they needed some leadership they needed some guidance and i thought right I, let's let's read this and get some inspiration and i got inspiration from that mm. um and there was a really good chapter in uh, in the dichotomy of leadership called uh, aggressive and not reckless, and it, it really applied to the time uh, applied at the time because what that meant was that I when 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 the when the cloud started to lift, um, we shouldn't just be sat in there in that sort of that that state that that fog that that defensive uh, shell like position, but we should that we should be ready to to expand and, and grow and, and do positive things. But in the act of doing so, not, not doing so in a, in a reckless way, 
um, and and therefore by just doing things at, at, in the right time in the right way. A bit like we said earlier, uh, not cutting corners and not trying to not not trying to apply the cheat codes to the video game. It's it's about we've still got to go through the levels, but we, we we'll just uh, but we should try and do things as as aggressively as we can. Yeah. Uh, and not and in in another way of putting it is being proactive, not being passive. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. That's probably an important way to to approach it. Um, I think it, other books that we we discussed were were Twelve Rules for Life by Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. Um, I, I gave a, a good quote from from that earlier. Um, I, I it's been a really meaningful been a really meaningful book for me uh, of late. Uh, it's been it's imparted some great wisdoms uh, for me. Uh, I also recently read Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. I think particularly in my line of work, the, it, it's, it's very easy to, to misread people's intentions and people's, um, the, the, people's thoughts. And so, uh, but ultimately, the, 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 net, uh, the net message that you get from that is, is to have faith in, in, in other people. Um, there's a good book on connection and communication uh, called Wired to Connect by Amy Banks, uh, and, and that's uh, and, and that's a very uh, uh, a very fascinating book. And, and anyone who works with teams and people uh, should should read that. Um, and, and particularly if if you're someone who struggles to connect connect with people on a personal level. Uh, and finally, um, the, uh, the, uh, the the seminal book by John Cabot Zinn, which is Wherever You Go, There You Are. Uh, which is uh, if you if you have any interest in meditation or mindfulness, um, that is a that is a must read, and uh, certainly has has made a, a profound impact on my life and and how I look at the world. And yeah. uh, the the word maybe is a uh, is is one that that you'll take from that for sure. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I, I've um, a number of them I read already, but I, I'm I've added to my my reading list uh, the Healing Connection dichotomy of leadership because i like uh, jocko and wired to connect so thank you for that so um over to you michael for the final two minute top tip okay so um hi i'm michael dean i'm co-founder and director of avonmore capital and chartfield homes and here's my two minute top tip for your listeners so the top tip that I'm going to be talking to you about is how to approach people who you haven't spoken to before and that you're looking to sell something to them or work with them for the first time. A lot of people, when they're trying to sell something, are approaching that kind of conversation with a, hi, I'm so-and-so, and this is what I do, and it's such a great product, and you should definitely buy it now. And that, in my experience, is not the way to approach it. I've had great success taking a different approach, which is when I pick up the phone to someone for the first time, and this is someone I'm looking to do business with, I want to get to know them and I want to speak to them. And I'll routinely spend 10 or 15 minutes speaking to them, provided they'll obviously afford me that amount of time. And in doing so, they will then tell me all about themselves. People instinctively like to talk about themselves and they feel good when they're talking about themselves. So by affording someone the opportunity to talk about themselves for that period of time, they instinctively feel good about themselves, but then they also feel good about you because they, that, that reflects on you because they think positively towards you because you're allowing them to speak. You're not interrupting them because people are interrupted all the time in conversations, especially by salespeople. And in doing so, that gives them a positive mindset. Selling is ultimately a psychological game. We routinely buy products for more than we should we could pay for them elsewhere the perfect example is going to a white tablecloth restaurant to have a a, a coca-cola when you could get that can of cola from the supermarket for a fraction of the price it's all about how we're made to feel and the experience that we have also because you've allowed someone to speak for a long period of time after a while they will turn around to you and say out of courtesy, because people feel embarrassed if they realize that when they realize that they've spoken for so long, they'll ask you what you do and what it is that you're selling. And by doing so, they've opened the door for you to be able to have that conversation with them, to tell them about your product. And because they feel positively about you already, 
they're going to find ways to do business with you and buy your product, even if they don't need your product necessarily. So that in a nutshell is if you give people the opportunity to tell you about themselves, you'll be able to build a much better rapport with them. And by building a rapport with them, they'll have a more positive feeling towards you. And consequently, they're more likely to want to buy, with, buy from you and do business with you. Michael Dean, thank you very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure having you on the series. There's such a, a depth and breadth of experience that you've got. And, and you've shared some great tips with us all. I'm most grateful to you. And thank you once again. Jonathan, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for sharing your wisdom as well. Okay.